macro thinking. But Paul, we're on, by the way. Oh, are we? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Go on. Chris Ryan. Yes, his own yeah. podcast. Yeah. What's it called? Danger. Is it Danger? <laughs> Hang on, let's get this right. Hang on, Chris Ryan podcast. Uh, Chris Ryan. Excuse us, listeners and viewers, yeah. while I do some Googling. Chris Ryan podcast. Uh, no. Oh, hang on. Where is it? Chris Ryan Instagram. It'll say on there, won't it? Yeah. Chris Ryan Instagram. Yeah. Chris Ryan. His new podcast is called Life and Death. Life or Death. Life or Death. There you go. Life or Death. Uh, yeah, I didn't know you were starting it. I literally, I think a week, about a week before he put that post out, Mm. I uh, I just let him know I'd, at the studio and said, you know, get your ass back on the podcast. We'll do it with, like better sound this time. And plus, if you want to use the studio, crack on. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, no worries, mate. Uh, said something about chopping trees. And then a week later, he had his own podcast. Mega. Mate, it's still well, but it looks a bit as well. Yeah. Looking forward to it. What uh, what were we on about when we started? Uh, well, loads of stuff. You told me to shut up and said, Three we'll times, I think I told you to shut up three times. <laughs> we'll talk about it on the podcast. <laughs> I was only supposed to meet you for a coffee. Oh, do you know what I'm not doing? <laughs> fucking camera. Shit. There you go, start there. You go. Jesus. Yeah. Right, so I so for people who um watch this on YouTube, uh it's yeah. me and I, I haven't realised it's me that switches the camera between me and the guest. Today is Paul Grinnell. Uh ex Irish Guards, primary physio podcast host. Creator, founder, yeah. yeah. Um, and I've so I have to concentrate on switching the camera between the people who are speaking. And right now I'm drinking, so things. Oh, well, there we go. As an example, that was on you then while I was talking. <laughs> Back on me. So yeah. Anyway, um, mate, pleasure to have you. It's nice yeah. to be able to do this off the cuff. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me over. It's um, right. I was. Um, how was COVID? How, in all seriousness, how has the pandemic been treating you work-wise? Um, well, it, it, it's been difficult initially. Uh, so I was on site. So I've, I think, I think from when we first got in touch, I was I was on site at Jaguar Land Rover running rehabilitation services and the functional restoration program over there. And you were more- with, with the boot neck I met, were you yeah, working Earl, with him? Yeah, Earl James, he was on uh, the podcast as well. He's the rehab instructor. Um, he's actually still there. Um, I took uh, an opportunity to go and work for a different company. So one of the, uh, well, it's the biggest <coughs> occupational health providers in the UK, um, had an opening. And um, yeah, I, I jumped a bit, nice bit of promotion. So I'm a senior hockey health physiotherapist for this company and we manage it's like business to business so it's given physiotherapy and occupational health to two other companies so usually frontline services big businesses blue chip companies um yeah congratulations, congratulations. thanks very so much man. yeah so where i was where i jumped to was national grid which is in warwick um so have you been down do you know where it is it's literally around the corner it's a massive huge business hub there's about three thousand four thousand people on site and they are essentially... Where is this? Where in Warwick is this? Uh, don't know. <laughs> I don't know from here. Have you been here? Have you been here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you been there? Have you been here? Well, yeah, I hope so. I was, have you, have I was been, on site. Um, have you been to the place? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I was working on site there for uh, until COVID, and then we had to pull back. So uh, it's the Warwick business. It's where, where the park is. You know where Warwick Park Saint is? Nick's. I think the, so. The big I'm, park in the yes. middle. And then you've got a school, and then behind it, there's a whole business hub. Oh, yeah. I know. Honestly. That's called. Uh, yeah, I know what that is. You've got full throttle motorcycles over there. Yeah. You've got. Oh, I tell you what, is that? Is. Uh, what is the gym where I was doing jujitsu? I told you about it. It's called Urban, Urban, Urban Fitness. Right. Anyway. That's over that way. Urban Fitness is on the same place, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you drive past past that place and you miss it. It's tucked away a little bit. So, but yeah, no, I was on site delivering a service, and um, they, we've had to pull back. So I've been working from home essentially and uh, managing caseloads and various other contracts that we've got from home. So that involves a lot of telephone triage and then video assessments. And immediately, you're probably thinking, "Well, how do you do physio over the video?" Hey, 
Uh, question for you. Yeah. So over pa- the pandemic, like, yeah. uh, one of the things that's really interesting to me is how people's health has been affected over the pandemic, yeah. mental and physical. Yeah. Has there been a change in, and it's not might not necessarily be down to there's more ill health, it just might be more availability or time in your hands. Has there been a change in the frequency or intensity of type of physio stuff you're having to deal with? Um, I'll tell you a little bit of both. It's worked in both ways. Um, I don't and this is just anecdotal. I don't have any kind of data or evidence to pull back on it. But in my just uh, just make just make well, it up like okay. extin- extinction rebellion. <laughs> do make shit up. Well, like uh, like yeah, like anyone who's <laughs> antifa makes shit up. Well, well, in my own experience, I've had a lot. Well, put it this way: I've had people that I've been managing with chronic back issues. Um, that when I continue to manage them through COVID, they're doing really well. And then they're doing really well because they haven't got things like the daily commute, the long hours in the kind of office chair. Pull that mic into Sorry, mate. Yeah. The long hours in the office chair, um, the meetings, you know, where everybody sat down. If they're working from home, they've got that freedom where they can get up, they can move around. I think the commute kills a lot of people off. You know what I mean? It really does. Um, it really starts off the effect for some people, especially backs anyway. So, yeah, if you're getting up early in the morning you've got a, a minimum of like an hour's drive an hour's drive is just that kind of it's that time where it's not long enough to take a break yeah and you just think oh, i just got to get there all right but it is long enough to cause especially in the morning where if you think about your spine because we're taller in the morning yeah so we rehydrate through the night and you're taller in the morning so all your intervertebral discs okay rehy- did you just say that we, we hang on we dehydrate or rehydrate through the night we rehydrate through the night how do you how well, your spine does, your, your intervertebral discs rehydrate through the night. They pull through osmosis, fluid into them. Go on. I didn't know. Go on. <laughs> yeah, okay. So if you measure yourself in the morning, you're going to be a couple of centimetres taller than what you will be of a night time. Nah, centimetres? Honestly, yeah, yeah. Well, two centimetres, one centimetre, two centimetres. That's tops. a huge amount. Well, of course it is, yeah. Well, okay, so you're constantly, as soon as you get up, you're working against gravity, all right? So your spine, which is just a column of intervertebral uh, uh, discs, sorry, well, it's intervertebral vertebrae, separated by fluid-based sacs, these discs, okay? And those discs, as soon as you wake up, well, when you're lying down, they're open, they're spread, so they can, they can rehydrate and they become natural and healthy, except sometimes in the morning, well, most of the time in the morning, they're overhydrated. That's why we're a lot taller. And then the first thing you do is if you get up, okay, you get in your car and you sit in a position which is a sitting position although like it's comfortable uh, and most most cars are comfortable to sit in for a certain period but like i said like if it's an hour it's it's long enough to cause postural problems and then you get to work and you've got a five minute walk from your car park to your desk where you're sat down probably for another couple of hours going through all your emails, going through everything else, going through your team meetings, going through what, well, whatever your day involves, and then before you get up and move around again. Yeah. And, that's what, and if you measure yourself before you go to bed, you're going to be, you're going to be shorter because you, you, your, your intervertebral discs are dehydrated because they've been working against gravity. Amazing. I wasn't <laughs> expecting this. this, this is, by the way, this is, not, this is not involved with anything of stuff I said to talk, stop talking about in the club yeah. before we came on. We got, this is really interesting. Like, no, it, it makes sense to me to be taller or shorter, but yeah. I thought you would imme- just by standing up, you'd immediately become shorter, not that there'd be a gradual change. And I didn't know that your vertebrae rehydrate you're in, no, 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 not your vertebrae, your intervertebral discs. So these are fluid-based kind of sacs. The, the, the disc that sits in between the vertebrae. It's like a tyre. Imagine like a tyre. Yeah. yeah. Like, like cartilage. Is that the cartilage? No. Right? Well, it, it, it's cartilaginous. There is some cartilaginous base in there, but it's a fluid sac. That's why if you have trauma or a build-up of, you know, like poor posture, there's quite a few variables that could go on here. Weight, lifestyle, all these things can essentially lead to a, an, a disc prolapse or a, or a protrusion. So there's a nucleus, there's a centre to the disc, Okay. And eventually what it does, it works against the path of least resistance, all right? And it will protrude either one side. It's usually left or right side. And that, that's why it boils down to 
well, one, what was the trauma or what was the uh, what was your lifestyle? So if you work in a position and you sit in a dog shit position for quite a long time, over to the left, eventually that nucleus pulp pulpus is going to work its way out against the annular tissue and it's going to protrude on the right side of your spine. Interesting. Yeah. Because when I was talking to, we were on a bit earlier, Mandy Bostwick, we yeah. finished that podcast. I feel like I'm too quiet. Here. Finished up. We finished that podcast. It's loud enough. Sorry, I've changed some settings on the uh, old audio, and I hope, I hope I haven't fucked it up. Like Gaz's podcast. Um, when we were talking on that episode ninety nine about TBIs and that, we finished the podcast. And after we were talking, and uh, she had she had basically been observing me while we were in that in that bloody interview, like she does. You know, like psychologists. Do the old, uh, you know, the long I've, stare. I've got, yeah, I've got psychologists in the family. And uh, in fact, Jenny Murray, she listens to this podcast. Psychologist or psychiatrist? Psychologist. If I always get the struggle with the difference. Anyway, you, people like that, right? I love you, Jenny. I'm, I'm, but I'm about to take the piss out of you. People like that, um, I'm always conscious of, you always think they're analyzing you. Like, like if you've got a doctor, like, you know, a doctor friend or like a physio friend. So if you, it's, if I was to say to a friend, I've got a, a sore knee, just a random friend, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. If I was to say to a, a physio friend like yourself, I've got a sore knee, like, hmm, tell me more about that knee, investigate it. Well, it's like on the uh, psychologist, psychiatrist front. So uh, also, they're not both the same thing, but Jenny, psychologist, I think. And uh, I remember being at, I hadn't seen her for ages. And we were at a dinner. And I'm probably digressing you. We were at a dinner. It was me, her, her family, her kids, her husband, me, my mum, my, I can't remember what else I said. Long story short, she said, um, when did you come back? Uh, so when did you get back from Afghanistan? I was still serving at the time. When did you get back from Afghanistan, Hugh? And I was like, uh, about September time. Um, and the next question was, how did that make you feel? <laughs> Like, that's not a normal, like, cousin question. What? <laughs> Straight into it. And again, with Mandy, did that, like, afterwards. Yeah, I noticed that you, when you're sitting down, your your body, your center line is slightly off to the left. Da -da -da, and she was thinking about it all from a traumatic brain injury, potential traumatic brain injury related neurophysiological effects on my brain, being able to, like, bat what's comfortable for my body and it's not all aligned and is that observation. Interesting. How do we get into that? You asked me how my caseload and patients were progressing. It's good. There's nothing wrong with digressing. There is nothing wrong with it. But any, but, but to to go, to go back to that, um, like I said, I think the commute that now that a lot of people aren't having to do that, some of them are getting better. Okay, so the chronic issues. So anything that goes past three months can essentially be classed in the kind of chronic area. Now before. I went to university, I used to think, well, chronic means that you, there's no chance of healing. It's not, it's just based on the time frame. It's the time frame that you've got it. Because most things, as long as you are fit and healthy, and you're, as long as there's no systemic illness, you will essentially get better within about three I months. I thought chronic meant you're never going to get rid of it. That's yeah, I so thought. did I. No, it doesn't. No, no, no. Yes, there are chronic illnesses that you can never recover from. However, chronic just means it's, it's a way of describing the time frame. So you've got acute yeah, so something that happens, okay, I'll walk into a door, bang my head, you know, it hurts for the next 24 hours. Sorry, it hurts for the next 24 hours. All right, it's acute, yeah. And then subacute is after that, if it's not starting to heal. And then if it goes on any longer, then it's a chronic issue, yeah. So no, nobody with back pain for a year comes up to you and says, I've got acute back pain. How long have you had it for? I've had it for a year. You go, well, that's chronic, that is. <laughs> right, yeah, so, so the yeah. term just relates to... Short-term, mid-term, long-term. Yeah, yeah, basically. yeah. And just on the discs, so this, so, 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 yeah. Grab, grab, grab. Sorry, grab, yes, grab you said that. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you get. Don't put yourself in front of the mic. You pull the mic to where you're comfortable. Right. Comfortable. Right. So just put, just put, look, yes, sir. Put <laughs> uh, so when you so a prolapsed disc. So so you got the vertebrae, uh, but the disc is a sack. So when people say disc, it's a sack of. Uh, liquid, <laughs> liquid stuff no. between the vertebrae. Yeah, no. Well, uh, God, I should have bought a spine with me, really, shouldn't I? Um, we could have. No, because it'd no, be no good for listeners who, <laughs> and that's predominantly people mostly listen to. Yeah, but go watch it on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's you uh, brought a spine. You brought a spine. Just not one you can use. <laughs> it's got this one, yeah. So yeah, so it's a it's a it's a fluid based sac right. with a, a nucleus in the middle, and it's surrounded by hard annular tissue. Um, and then eventually, through age, all right, that disc starts to become dehydrated. 
And then the nucleus, like I said, just works its way out. And it's when that starts to work its way out, it's met either side, left or right, by a nerve root. And it's when it starts to push on that nerve root, that's where you get sciatic symptoms. So the term sciatica, it's a very kind of... It's a, it, it, it encompasses so many different things. GPs love to give out a diagnosis. Well, you've got sciatica. Well, yeah, but sciatica, that, what does that mean? It, it, it's, it's a collection of symptoms. Something is causing the sciatic nerve to be triggered or to be over, or hypersensitive. Does it mean there's a, a problem at the disc? Not necessarily. You can have sciatic symptoms. There's a muscle in your hip called piriformis. So you can, have, you can have piriformis syndrome, which means the muscle gets really tight. And because the sciatic nerves run, run through it, it'll give off sciatic symptoms. And that's where your assessment comes in and getting the diagnosis right. And then that affects your treatment. But going back to your initial question, <laughs> some people have been improving, some haven't. So they sent everybody home and they said, right, we've all got to work from home. And what we started to see after the first few weeks was people with kind of like minor postural issues really start to suffer because they were working from their dining room table, <coughs> chairs, footstools, you know. I mean, I've phoned one patient up. He's like, I've been working off my bed, you know. And it's just like, well, I'm going to make your bed's designed for sleeping. There are furniture companies that pump thousands of pounds into designing chairs that are designed to look after you and a, a lot of these businesses that um it's, it's a bit cheeky they've sent them all home and said well just work from home and then but you see the dsc regulations all right which is legislation apply to the home environment because right. if that's your working environment well then you are more than entitled to say well i want to i'd like a desk if you want me to work from home, I want a desk, I want a chair, I want laptop stand. So my experience, as boring as it may seem, in this area is extensive, okay? <laughs> so it started off, it start, my first experience of the importance of display screen regulations, right? And health and safety executive, you know, uh, guidelines and yeah. rules and the Health and Safety Work Act and all that. So this first came my radar, it didn't even come my first involvement with it without even knowing. My my third and last tour of Afghan, I went out in an intelligence capacity, but at a company level. So I was I spent a significant amount of time at a desk in a fob, well, at the patrol base, but I would also go out on the ground. I had like a sort of best of both worlds, except, mate, do you know what an office environment is like in a fucking patrol base? It was like a table. It was ridiculous. Like, laptop. Uh, I'm not complaining, obviously, because this is like Afghan, but laptop was uh, it's on, on, on reflection. The, the other laptop, the table was, these are things that are made out of pieces of wood in a patrol base. In, you know, it's a fighting, it's a, it's a place where you base fighting from, right? And patrols from, defense from. It's not designed for an office environment. So, you know, tables are made out of random bits of fucking wood. Yeah, the chair was a, one of those fold up, you know, canvas issue chairs that the stores would have. Um, mm. So long story short, the chair was too small, the desk was too high. Um, and if I wasn't out on the ground, I would spend all day writing, uh, doing analysis, doing threat assessments, writing reports for the boss. Um, and it, that developed into my first ever repetitive strain injury. And it's on my neck. And it's like, I say first ever because it, it's been re it's repeated itself and I've also had it in, in the elbow. And people pay lip service to repetitive strain injuries. I can tell you this now. That RSI that I had was in my neck. And it was the most painful thing I've ever had. And all it was from is my, it was, I was sitting in, in a poor position for multiple, I mean, a hideously poor position for multiple hours a day for months, right? Which is not uncommon in here in the UK for people, like you said, working from home, but also in the office environment with all the kit they need, but they're just not set up properly to be comfortable in that situation. And on that side, like I said, people pay lip service to it. But if you were there and you were subliminally slightly uncomfortable, it impacts the way you're able to focus and work. It really impacts the way you work. In my case, it was a hideous impact. The pain was like I was having a skewer put into my neck, C-spine, so, you know, that neck area straight in and it would it would be something that would come on after i'd be sitting there for 20 minutes 30 minutes and as time went on it would get that it would come on quicker and there was no there was no getting rid of it there was no position i could make myself to get rid of that pain i would have to stand up and, and well stand up and move away 
that was then. Then I obviously came back from Afghan and I left the military. And then I ended up in a... Uh, down the line, I ended up in a job where, again, a lot of desk work. And I started getting that pain again. At the same time, I started doing some health and safety training. I did my knee wash courses. I wanted to basically give myself more tools, to get more chance to get a job, come back to the UK because I was working in the Middle East. Um, and then, so I ended up landing a fucking mega job, which is a corporate health and safety manager for a, a, quite a large company, you know, a few thousand people working for them. And I was the, 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 the top health and safety doc. But what was good about that is I had, when you're talking about display screen equipment regulations and all the health and safety stuff, I, I could go into offices and go, and I would give advice, especially on the sitting position, the the screen height position, the the kind of mouse you're using, the keyboard position, what type of chair you got, and go, right, this is, look, here's a demonstration about ideally how you want to be set up. Your arms want to be at 90 degree angle. Your forearms want to be resting in the thing. Your, your feet want to be flat on the floor. All that, you know, blah, 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 blah. Screen height. The top of the screen wants to be eye level with you. All that stuff that you and I know. But I was able to say, and this is what happens if you don't do it. And I give that Afghan thing. It's like, this, you know, as silly as it sounds, this is how bad it can be. And people pay lip service to it, mate. And you go from working from home to, to carry on with that. When, this, when the pandemic hit, one of the things I thought is, oh my God, the cost this is going to be for companies, even though they don't realise it, it's going to be huge cost for the companies to do it properly. Because, for example, for Inmarsat, who I work for, my employer, right, who have got lots of money behind them, yeah, they've got lots of resources. They send everyone home now, like you know, like I know, and as you mentioned to which is how we come into this conversation, if you are being told to work from home by your employer, they have got an obligation to give you everything you need to work from home correctly. And that falls in line with health and safety, executive advice, display screen equipment regulations. To that end, that means you could, win all within all your rights, ask for a proper desk like you've got to work, a proper office chair like you've got to work, a proper screen like you've got to work, a proper fucking mouse, you know, all of that. If you use a footstool, a footstool at work, all of that stuff, you are quite entitled to ask for that. And if they don't provide it, they are they are breaking the law. That's it. That, that's it. But most people don't know it. I mean, in my sat turned around and said... I don't know if I can fucking say this, actually. The Inmarsat turned around and said, I'm going to say it anyway, because it's a positive thing, they're mega. And they said, they basically said to each employee, obviously thousands of people who are now working from home, otherwise had all the stuff provided for them, for them at the office in London, at Old Street, or elsewhere in the world, they gave every employee a budget. And they said, there is the budget. You are allowed to spend that on anything you need for working from home within reason like you know everything we scrutinized it wasn't like one of surround sound system and you know you'd have to be but there are employers that know that and they don't tell people and they fucking get away with it and there's also employers who know that and then you get an employee who asks and then you get fucking sacked or you get let go of because you're taking the piss when it's it's uh it, it again Pay lip service to it. Make yourself comfortable at work in the office or at home. You have to do it because long term impact is chronic chronic pain. And that, that was a chronic pain in my neck. That went on for a long time. It's hideous, man. It's hideous. Well, okay. Well, well, have I just spent ten minutes ranting on about this place going equipment regulations? Mate, good dip. Sorry, listeners. Good dip. <laughs> I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> what was the budget? I'm, 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 I'm definitely not going to say that. I'm not going to say it. Okay. I'm not well, say it. Well, well, okay. Well, look. Uh, oh, oh, it was. Listen, it was a good amount. Give me a ballpark figure, roughly. No, I'm not. No, okay. No, I'm not. Okay. No, I'm not. Well, I, let, no, well, I, can't, I, can't, well, I don't okay. know if it's confidential information. I'm not going to do it. Fair so enough. No it problem. It's a good amount. It's a good. Okay. Amount. Well, let's just say you get allocated a budget of two thousand pounds. Okay. So even if you get two thousand five hundred pounds, that will that will get you a stand up desk. Yeah. That a height adjustable desk, a decent one from a good provider. That'll get you a decent chair. Okay, that'll get you all the uh, additional equipment that you need: uh, laptop stand, upright mouse, headset, so you can do a lot of audit, um, dictation rather than typing. That two thousand pound offset. Let's say you go off, all right, and you're off sick. They still have to pay your sick pay. They still have to pay your wage. A lot of this stuff comes with um, warranties. A lot, all the chairs nowadays come with a minimum of a five or a ten year warranty. So even if your chairs are grand and it's got a ten year warranty, that's hundred pound a year. 
No, just to keep you in work, so keep comfortable. It's it's sickness and absence. That's where the biggest cost is. It's costing this country an absolute fortune. But I mean, you know. Do you know what the ah uh, question for you? Oh, in fact, going yeah. back, I mean, we're assuming that, like you and I. I'm assuming you can. We could have. We can fit a desk in our home. We can fit a chair in. A lot of people, especially in London, who like sitting in like a, a flat share or a house share or like a one bed, they can't even fit a desk in. And and that complicates things that complicates things more. But do you know what the I can't believe you're on the health and safety. Can do you know what the biggest uh the biggest cause of work related ill health is in the UK? Biggest cause, what is it? Mental health. St yeah, stress. Stress. Yeah, it's mental stress. health related. Yeah, yeah stress. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Bang on. It, it, a few years ago, it used to be uh, it used to be musculoskeletal. Well, for the uh, for the manual based roles, it was it was musculoskeletal, and then mental health. That was like nineties, though, wasn't it? When when it was craziness, it was like fucking mental mental no, pants working on sites. No, it wasn't too long ago where we had a real boost in um, automotive, and we we were building quite a lot of stuff, and um, somebody trying to get it. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, and then mental health has, has overtook it in the last year, but um, but yeah, I don't, know, I don't know how we got onto this situation. But so, so essentially, some through the lockdown, it's worked for some people and it hasn't worked for us, to be honest. And that's where kind of we kicked in as a hockey health company to keep these people essentially working. So, uh, but yeah, but no, it's, it's been good. But you know, I, I, for my own mental health, I'm in a clinic and I, you know, I enjoy seeing people, treating people. Having to chat—that's as communication is as much as part of the uh, the role as a physio as it is, uh, you know, just dishing out exercises or telling people what to do or the ergonomic side of things, saying you need this or you need that. You know, it's communication. It's, it's been with people, uh, building rapport and saying, right, I think you benefit from this. Let's do this as a treatment. Let's help you understand this. And uh, it, it, you, you're putting up an extra barrier if you have to do that over a Teams invite or a Zoom meeting. You know, and you're sat there, and sometimes you know, like internet connection, your internet connection is not great. It goes off very for the assessment. You just like, oh god, yeah, yeah. I did a I did a course of physio on it via Zoom while well, the pandemic was on. Oh, uh, did you? Golf, uh, golfer's elbow. Yeah, mate. What? Fucking absolutely great right now. Uh, we're six months into it now. Mental. Um, I'll talk to you about it after. Do you play golf? No, <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, not anymore. Um, uh, How did you get golfer's elbow if you don't play golf? Right, so it was. I'm joking. I'm joking. It's just. It's. I started just, doing more pull-ups than normal. That's yeah. what it was. I was getting ready. So, for, I got getting ready for the Murph challenge. Okay, so when when and you, I introduced a lot of kettlebell exercises. So when you were doing the pull-ups, were you doing it in this position with your hands? I was doing it in both. Okay, yeah, I was doing it in both. Well, that's a pull-up. Okay, that's a chin-up. Do that and again. It has Do that again because the camera's on you now. That's you a, that's a chin-up. So, so, so palms towards you is a chin-up. Yeah, go on. That, Palms out, that's a pull-up. Palms, pull up. Palms, palms away, away from you yeah. is a pull-up. Well, you're using different muscle groups. If you do chin-up, you rotate your hand and you put more strain on the muscle. That's probably why. <laughs> you use a different both muscle group. Same. Both <laughs> <laughs> um, how is the how has how has things been for the podcast over the pandemic? Yeah, so... Because we were talking about this beforehand. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's only about the impact of, of, for, yeah. for me. Yeah. And what about yourself? So well, firstly, I, I, I need to thank you. I need to say thanks very much because well, because you helped me out get it off and up and running off the floor. So uh, yeah, you did. Yeah, I came. It was you I approached and said, "Look, I've got this idea." I'd come across you one night um, and your stuff. It was in the early stages. I think you were on episode twelve by then, and I reached out. Was it that early that we yeah, started talking? Twelve. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, uh, "Jesus Christ!" Yeah, I said, "I've got this idea. I want to get people on. I want to. I, I wanted to. I wanted to start with the X Forces community, um, and get their stories of recovery. Um, and then, and then it kind of it's like most things. It takes a different direction because, you know, because I do jujitsu. Um, I started speaking to jujitsu. Uh, Coaches, judo guys, people who did jujitsu but had, you know, had injuries and were still on the mats. You know, if you think about the physical aspect of jujitsu, and then so uh, why did it, why training. did why did it start taking that direction? Why do you think that happened? I don't. I think I got a few knockbacks. So a few people I asked, I said, "Look, I'm doing a podcast. Would you like to, you know, come and share your story?" They were just a little bit. Oh, I'm not ready for that yet. I don't. I don't, do I don't want to share that just do yet. You know so. Do you know what's interesting? In a minute, right? I think these at the moment mm. it's 
had lots of noise at the moment, didn't I? Mm. I don't know if you can hear this on the... Anyway, yeah. Um, <laughs> the... Yeah, I, I think... I reckon, especially if, it, if you're going to approach people who mm. get asked to do podcasts all the time, because po- all you at the moment is podcast, podcast. It's like the buzz thing, like podcast, podcast. And especially people who have got a significant following or they're well known, relatively well known, right? They probably get beasted all the time. Or you might probably better off just asking people, can I interview you? Just massage their ego. I really like to interview you. Not, will you come on my podcast? I really like your interview. I want to. I want to get inside your mind. Jesus. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> go on, mate. This is what happens when you're on the coffee, right? And I'm on Thatcher's. <laughs> yeah. So uh, go on. Tell me how, how's it been going? Yeah, it's going well. I had a I had a goal initially, and it was to get twelve episodes in for a year. What right? was the goal? What was the aim of the episodes? What did you want to achieve from those episodes? Well, I wanted to. I wanted to speak to people who had had. Well, I would. I would kind of. Yeah. I would say are pretty significant injuries. I've made good recoveries from them and we're getting on and progressing with their lives and we're we're doing really well. Why did you want to speak to them? What was the objective? Oh, it was to get their story out. Um, It was to get their story out so other people could listen to it, be inspired by it and go, well, if he can do it, you know, then then I can do it. Um, And then, uh, yeah, just, uh, then it got to... I then it got to the stage where I was just like, well, I'm just enjoying chatting to people now. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. If I go through each and every one, it started off, most of these people were my patients. So my first person was Melissa Mullins, who was a patient of mine, who had, um, she had, uh, uh, it's, called, it's called an O'Donoghue's triad uh, rupture. It's where you rupture three ligaments all in one. So basically we were... In the same joint? <laughs> yeah, the same oh knee. God. So we were in training one night. Uh, somebody took her back. And you're not supposed to, if you take the back, you're not supposed to pull them back. Sorry, pull away from the mic. And pull them back whilst their knees are on the floor because it can cause serious torque and twist. And they pulled her back. Unless you're in competition, obviously. Unless you're in competition, then, you know, it's oh, you can do what you want. But in the gym, gym etiquette is like, don't do that. So somebody pulled her back. I didn't, I didn't know that, by the way. Yeah, I know yeah. It now. Okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, somebody pulled her back. Her knee was on the floor and it, her ACL... Uh, her meniscus and her MCL all just ruptured oh, all in one go, and you know, and she's a, she's a like an amateur MMA fighter. So she went for the operation, did really well, and then she approached me because I was training with her in the gym, and she she went for that kind of initial post op rehabilitation at the at the hospital where they get you to walk, and then as long as you can walk, it's like you know she's like, well, I'm an MMA fighter, I need to be at this decent level. And they were just like, look, as long as you can walk, excuse me, we're not interested. So she came to see me. And that's when I had my clinic in Canley. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's easy because I know exactly what is required of a task. So um, <laughs> taking a picture. Of once. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, yeah, so she came to see me. We did all the rehab. And uh, yeah, she was back on the mats training within about, I think about six or seven months. And then she went to the IMM, I better get this right. The, it's the amateur IMMAFF, I think it is. It's the amateur MMA league. She went to Italy about a year and a half after her um, her trauma and she won a silver medal. She KO'd everybody right up into the final and then she got robbed in the final and she won a silver medal. And, she'd, and it was just fantastic. And I was just like... You know, it was, it was an amazing story. And I thought, um, I want to get... And she was oh, proper motivated. So incredibly motivated individual when it came to a rehabilitation. Oh, I remember watching that first podcast that you did. And, uh, yeah, which was in the car, wasn't it? You yeah. were in the car, weren't you? Yeah, Mega, yeah. mega. That's what I love about this podcast in Malarkey. It's like, yeah, well, I'm not going to digress. But, yeah, I was watching her and um, you can just tell I'm super motivated, mate. But women, women are MA fighters. It's like... They are a different beast from women. They're like a different species altogether. Fighting doesn't come naturally to women. It just doesn't, right? It doesn't come naturally to most men. It doesn't. Aggression comes naturally to most men, but fighting doesn't, right? As much as people would like to think, oh, yeah, I'm I'm cool with confrontation. No, most people are not cool with confrontation because they don't get to do it very often, like very rarely, Um, which is one of the things. Yeah, one of the reasons I got into jiu-jitsu, 
one of the reasons I started boxing, just to sort of get comfortable in it. Because I'm not comfortable with it, right? And I'm, what am I, 38 now? Um, but her, mate, people like her, completely comfortable with They He fear those people. You can walk down a woman like that in the street. I wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't bat an eye at her in terms of threat. But, oh, she mate, her. you do not want to mess with, mess with her no. or any people like that, mate. It just it, well yeah it just goes to show uh, I mean if you you know you look at her in her younger stages she's like a typical she was a skater chick I think you know and now she's just but uh, you know but her boyfriend was my instructor at that time uh, he's a BJJ black belt now and he's a he's pro he's gone pro James Dixon oh, pro BJJ or pro no MMA? pro well, yeah pro uh, MMA what, yeah, what's yeah. he fighting what's he fighting him? Uh, I, I'm not sure the promotion. Um, it's, it's it's kind of one that's kind of on the fringes of becoming pretty good, but uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. But I think the obviously the aim is they have to work their way up. But but yeah, no, she would be in the training. She's a BJJ blue belt, very competent, and you know she'd strangle you, and you know she'd tap you out. No, you know and she was brilliant. But I thought she had a great story, and you know a rehabilitation, a motivation. She would rock up, you know. I, and it was just, and I just thought, right, let's get that out to inspire other people. And then from there it went on, and then I interviewed, you know, my mate Earl, who I worked with. You know, I thought that was an incredible story as well. You know, the guy, uh, you know, in, in Afghanistan, more or less flipping, did some real serious damage to his back. And, he, you know, again, he's a BJJ blue belt. He's, on, he's out there lifting. He works as a personal trainer. I thought if he can get back to that level. Then it just went on from there, you know. Then I got Steve, you know, guys. He's, Steve. There's uh, Steve Turbot, he runs Turbo MMA, 98% blind, pr- former para, uh, Paralympic uh, judo uh, British uh, team member. You know, like he, he needs 2% vision to <laughs> strike. And he enters mainstream competitions and wins, and it's just fantastic. And so then it became more about BJJ. Well, it became injury BJJ related. And yeah, so I'm renaming the podcast soon, and that'll be out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to rename it Grappling with Physio. Grappling, grappling with physio. I like that. So it's going to be called the grappling with physio. The, this is the thing. It's not a drop. It's like it, that's why I was asking why, why uh, you know, why, why you sort of started up what the aim was because it's not a drama. I think I, I definitely think with podcasting, right, um, is that it's so easy and accessible to do. Okay, mm. and let it's not like. TV or fucking news, whatever you see. If if you're doing it like you and I do it, and just like we we're talking off air before, chatting and look, it, it is what it is. We're gonna. This is life. Let's just. That's how it gets recorded. You don't have to. You know. There's no. There's no agenda here. You know. We, we don't. It's not key, key points we want to get across or or opinions we want to get across. To see where it goes. Um. And in that case, if you start something like you did. And it sort of naturally veers away, and in, uh, which is a, one of the highlight with yours. It's it's naturally veered in a different course what you thought it would, not because of uh, it's done it because of the right reasons. It's done it because of the right reasons because it's veered towards what interests you is what it is, and that means if if you keep it on what the what interests you path, which is what I endeavour to do all the time with this. It maintains the quality of the podcast, the quality of the conversation. And granted, like we were saying earlier, what you the, it's a niche area that you're in. It's it's not a mainstream. You know, everyone's going to enjoy this kind of thing. It's about combat, the combat sport, and physical uh, recovery from physical injury is what it's about which is a, a pretty niche area but fucking hell it's useful mate mm. it's really useful you know it's a really useful area a really insightful area to learn from every podcast you can learn from it either if it's experience of what people have gone through emotionally like um like the lady what was her name the first one uh, melissa, melissa melissa yeah melissa. yeah yeah or um or physical rehabilitation like we were talking just now i've just learned about discs <laughs> yeah 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 well yeah. Uh, i mean i uh I, I, I think I've done it for personal reasons as well, you know. Like, it, it, it takes a lot, I think, to put content out there. You know what I mean? It takes, you know, to hold it out there and go, there you go, you know, and not be fearful of the fact that somebody will go, who does he think he is? What's he doing? You know. It's a good point, mate, I think, to highlight. Well, that, you're on about that it takes a lot in terms of emotionally. Yeah, yeah to put you your balls in line, that's yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. But I think the other one to highlight for people who are listening and thinking, oh, let's fucking get a podcast and we'll go and do it or start one up or whatever. It also takes a lot of, like, 
for me anyway, I don't know what your experience is, but for me, as I've gone on, I I want things to be more polished in the way I pres- attract people. So I so what I do now is, I'll, they, like this is what we're doing now, I'll record this, then my aim is what, that it'll get released, and then for five days after it's released, a clip goes out of this podcast each day. Yeah, so that's six days. So that's six days of clips and social media content I need to generate. So... It's an hour and a, we could be going for an hour, two hours, right? Th- fucking three hours, whatever. That's that. Then it's at least two hours on top of that. So if I record an hour podcast, hour and a quarter, it's at least another two hours of just getting it prepped to be released. It's like, it's a lot of work. And the thing with it is, is that you got a day job. I got a day job. We're doing it in addition to that. Um, But you end up chucking your energy into it anyway. My whole waking time, and my missus will testament is a, a testify to this because she breaks her sometimes. If I'm not at work, as in my day job, I am doing podcast stuff because I have to. It's like I've got it. I have to spend my time doing the podcast, prepping stuff, you know, um, lining up guests, uh, arrange, you know, editing those clips and putting stuff together. It takes a lot of, it, and you will put that energy in. It's a, you should. It it it's a, it seems a really th- easy thing that you and I are doing but if anyone's listening now and thinking ah, I'll go and do something like that you gotta like talk, give it serious consideration talk to people I'm happy for people to reach out to me about it like as you did you know in the start I'm, I'm sure you're happy for people to reach out and go oh, okay this is what I'm thinking about doing brief me up in terms of effort and time how long is it going to take me and it's an important question to ask because if you haven't got the time and effort aside from just the chatting bit and recording bit to put into it then it means that you are maybe not going to get from the podcast what you want to get from it. And so you'll either see yourself as having failed at doing it, which is the wrong way to look at it, right? Or you'll see yourself as um, it not achieving what you want it to achieve, basically. Oh, they're one and the same, I suppose. It's a really important It's a really important point you raised, actually. Mm. Yeah, it's fucking so much. The emotional aspect of it, it's, it's, a, lot, it's a big stressor for me. Like, this is like the best, my, my favourite times in a podcast, this is... The actual time when I'm actually sitting here, actually talking to people. This is it. This is the best bit. Then everything else, the other fucking two or three hours outside of it, that's a fucking nightmare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, additional admin. And I think that goes unnoticed that, you you, you know, you think, and, and this is why I approached it because you like, look, well, I use a studio. And I think what I wanted was to be able to rock up with my kit bag, uh, you know, with my gi to a gym, with my camera, uh, which is my phone, my stand, my mics, and after a training session, approach one of the coaches, do you want to chat? Um, and, it, you know, it, it, I like that kind of grainy, uh, unpolished look. That suits me because I hope to just bang out 12 episodes a year. What I've started to do now is little kind of short videos, injury management tips, specific to BJJ, grappling, judo, whatever. Uh, Matt, I, think, I, I generally mm. think there's real legs in that. There is real legs in that. Because what, this is the other thing, what, if you're thinking about doing a podcast, is there anything out there that's similar? What is similar to it? Should you do it? Are you going to make a difference? Because that's, that's really what it is. I think if you're not trying to promote something, deliberately trying to promote a business or whatever, and I can see it. So I'm not trying to promote a business that I've got in this podcast. So it means I'm not beholden to anything like that. So if you were just doing it because you feel like you can get information out there, is there anything else? Like I'm talking to people who are thinking about doing one. Is there anyone else doing it like you are? Are you going to make a difference? Because if not, then weigh up the pros and cons. Because it, there is, there's a balance to it as well. Because you, as in the person conducting the podcast, interviewing, uh, like you do, Paul, like I do, I get something from this. There is mm. positive I get from it. So balance all that. What the positives are, when the negatives. With yours, mate, I don't think there's any, is there anything out there like what you're on about? Is there? I don't think there is. And no. and, and how how important a part in... Uh, people who compete in combat sports lives is avoiding and recovering from injury well yeah I mean, huge. But then, yeah huge well, well, well you know like anything it's a it's a balancing act isn't it and uh this is the problem if you've got an injury you know it's very hard to keep training with that injury because you're at risk of making it worse so yeah but it, it, with the podcast it is a balancing act in the fact that uh what i kind of pull into it needs to balance with my full-time job with my family and my three kids and all the other things that I like doing. And, and that's where you kind of need to be careful. If it's a hobby, then it stays a hobby. 
and you know you you make sure that your expectations aren't too high just in case it, well you know it, it is what it is don't expect it to go anywhere don't expect you know anything but it's always good to hold out that hope and say well you know somebody might watch it and somebody might like it and somebody might get something from it i mean one experience uh that i had uh, i was down in london i was doing some work and uh, again, pack my ghee, <laughs> as I do when I yeah, go working, uh, especially away from home. Find out where there's a local BJJ gym, rocked up. It was a Gracie Baja, uh, Fulham. And the head coach down there is a guy called uh, Legato. It's his nickname. It's Brazilian. It means lizard. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> nicknamed him. <laughs> He's a lizard. <laughs> Legato means <laughs> lizard. It's Brazilian. Out. Portuguese for li- uh, lizard. Because uh, he's got... I, don't, like, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't until I looked up. Anyway, um, you know, what an ins- inspiring... Is, na- is his name actually Legato? Is that his nickname? That's his nickname. Uh, yeah. Lizard. It's yeah. Luis. Uh, his real name's Luis Rodriguez, I think. But his nickname... Everyone knows him as Legato. But he's famous well famous within the BJJ community because the guy beat cancer and he was 10 days after 10 days after receiving chemo he was competing in ADCC so ADCC Abu Dhabi Abu Dhabi uh, no 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 Abu Dhabi is one of the uh, sometimes they have it in Abu Dhabi but AD, ADCC is just the tournament Abu Dhabi could be gi or no gi but he was in ADCC 10 days after chemo oh he was competing no, that, that that's their the, the BJJ's equivalent to like the Olympics and it's 10 days after chemo, you know, because he had, um, he had Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yeah, but that, did, he, did he win? Because uh, it doesn't I count don't. if he got choked out in like round one. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I think he did all right. I don't. It does yeah, count. It does I, count. I can't remember the count. result, to be honest with you. I'd be kicking myself. Probably people watching this screaming, going, like, you know, nothing. But, you know, he did really. And uh, I think it was a tournament before that. He had a broken arm, you know, and it's just chatting to these people it just it's quite inspiring you know what I mean so if you if you if you find something you like and I did I found funny enough I found and how I found BJJ was because when I was in my private practice a uh, patient came in a uh, lad called Mark Smith he's a good mate really good mate of mine uh, we, we are now and that's how it usually works <laughs> become mates with my patients supposed to keep a you know a professional boundary but he came in and he, I says right what's up with you and he goes got an arm issue got a shoulder issue got a neck issue I was like what have you been doing and he says I do this thing called jiu-jitsu and I had this image of like a kido and I, I don't really know and I just went oh yeah all right because my background was boxing I did boxing for years oh did you yeah yeah was the b- well, I just started like I just started like three months ago two months ago three months ago yeah yeah started again, oh, right. good good on you nice yeah. Yeah. well yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's different it's not like a a, a, a uh, yeah being a jiu-jitsu gym well they're two sports. different sports aren't they yeah they yeah. I and it, I, again I, I've only been I'm at one gym I've not tried anything else yet but anyway go on so anyway he came in and I got chatting to him and he says, I do uh, jiu-jitsu. And I, and I was like, oh, right, okay. And he says, no, no, it's Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I was like, oh, right. He says, uh, look, because I was kind of like, you know, eyes up in the air. <sighs> yeah, all right, whatever, mate. Um, been a bit of a boxing snob. But, and uh, he says, you ever heard of uh, the Gracie family? And I says, yeah, yeah, don't, don't they? But I didn't know who they were. And he went, yeah, they keep, you know, they won the UFC and all the rest of it. They more or less formed it. He said, look, tell you what, watch a documentary called Choke. All right. Yeah, it was one night, everyone got to bed, you know, Friday, and I put this thing on, <laughs> couldn't sleep. <laughs> it was phenomenal, and I couldn't, I could not wait to start doing something. And then, and then I spoke to Earl, my mate Earl James, and he said, I've been doing it, you know, years. He says, I just do the, the no gear, I don't put the gear on. And uh, we worked with this, this, this guy we knew from Coventry. He is the um, lad called Matty Evans, and he's a protege of a guy called Jeff Thompson. And if you've never heard of Jeff Thompson, oh, Jeff Thompson, Jeff Thompson is, he's been on London Real. Um, he's, he was heralded as like one of the top martial arts guys, basically, top five back in the day. He, he's wrote loads of books, Watch My Back, and he's wrote quite a few uh, short documentaries. And he was basically a doorman fighter. He's, he's done loads, but he's, he's gone full, full circle. He's got a very interesting, you know, backstory. He developed this def- self-defense technique called The Fence. And he, t- he wrote something called the three second fight. He said all fights eventually end up on the ground. So this guy, this lad, Matty Evans, he's his protege. But I treated Matty as well. It's the thing, when you run a physio clinic, most of the PTs, fighters, they, you know, to keep themselves in work will eventually seek out somebody to help them manage their injuries. So I started working with him. 
And then me and Earl started doing one-on-ones with Matty and he was teaching us grappling. And then that's when I joined Lions Gym. And then I was at Lions Gym up until I got my blue belt. And then I wanted to, there's a guy in Birmingham who's, he's heralded as the grappler of our generations called Brali Esteema. All right. You he's, mentioned him before. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he he opened up, he opened up a greasy Baja in Birmingham. Well, it was handed down to him by a guy called Mauricio Go- Gomez. And Mauricio Gomez is Hodger or Roger you know, because they say, Hodger, hey, Hodger, yeah. yeah, it's Hodger, Roger Gracie's dad, Hodger Gracie's dad. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, what? yeah, yeah. Hang yeah. on. <laughs> I thought Hodger yeah. Gracie's dad was Helio. No, no, no. Go on. No. Roger or Hodger, you know, Brazilian's the Hodger, artist, say, isn't it? Pronounce, Hodger, say it, pronounce it properly, yeah. So Hodger Gracie's dad is a guy called Mauricio Gomez. Mauricio Gomez came over and he, uh, when he left Brazil, he went to Japan and then he ended up in Birmingham. <laughs> you know, of all the places... He ended up in Birmingham and he set up, you know, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, school. And then eventually he handed it over to Braulio. I think there were a few people in between that. Um, but yeah, essentially it's it's Braulio's club. And then Braulio has built this legacy in the West Midlands, you know, from there. He's like one of the, you know, he's in the Midlands, he's in Birmingham, this guy. And he's, you know, the way my mate, the, the lad, the patient that came in, described it, he said... Uh, what would you do if Mike Tyson had a gym and he coached in Birmingham? You know, and I said, well, I'll be there every day. And he says, well, there's this guy called Briley Esteem, you should go look him out. So when I got to Blue Belt, I says, oh, I, I, I want to train. I want to train under Briley. So I moved to Birmingham. And, uh, and then I was there for six months. And then COVID <laughs> kicked in. You know, and it's just like, oh, so, yeah. So that's nightmare. So I'm yeah. just doing one on ones with Steve Turbot now in Canley. So I do like uh I, I the the power of BJJ like BJJ it's again, I have I mate, I, I got introduced to it if I'm on this backstory, but I got introduced to it and when I was working in the Middle East and I was very lucky to be able to have lots of uh either one on one sessions with a blue belt. Um, which isn't, obviously it's not a purple belt, it's not a brown belt, it's not a black belt, but it's a fucking, to get, just to get your blue belt in BJJ, as you know, huge amount of effort. Um, and I was able to either have one-on-ones with a blue belt or it would be him and maybe two or three of us. So, you you know, it's like you go to a class, BJJ class in the UK, you're talking 10, 15, 20, 30 people. Well, I was, the instruction of student ratio was really small. And we were doing it, I'd do it for an hour every evening. And then maybe I'd do an hour boxing after an hour with a Muay Thai. When I say boxing, with a, a boxing guy or with a guy Muay Thai. I was, re, with it, I was in that combat sport. I'm in my element. Yeah, brilliant. But just instructional, no sparring like that. Apart from BJJ, because you, a core part of BJJ in the class is sparring, right? Uh, which is not in other, is not that in other arts, which are one of the things I love about it. But it was always touted to me when I was looking up at it as it was, it was, it was, it was an art that was formed to uh, to give small uh, to give people an advantage or to enable people to fight effectively against people who are bigger than them bigger in mass or weight or both right uh, and that and that I understood it when I started training locks manip- joint manipulation and all that but you know when it I, feel, I I really realized Jesus Christ, this is super effective in reality for from a, 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 from a women's perspective in terms of they're generally the the fairer sex and they're, they're smaller and lighter than than men. I I was teaching my daughters a few years ago basic moves re, and just with a self defense thing. One of the things I taught them was the rear naked choke, right? I just just a little, a little anecdote here, and taught them to put it on. And I was always saying to them. In fact, you know, I did, well, it wasn't them because my youngest was too young. I was my eldest. And she was probably at the time 12 years old, 11, 12 years old. Really naked choke, right. I th- she tried to put it on, also ha- also saying to her, okay, but if you're going to do this in practice, you only do it with daddy, okay, do it anyone else, all right, and I'll show you how to do it. And if you, and if you, when it gets too much for you, as in when I, if I'm choking her, and you tap my hand, and as soon as I tap my, my arm, I will stop, okay? And if you do it to me, you do the same thing. And I will tap you and you stop. I will let you put that choke on me until I'm nearly out. As in, I'm, I'm like, oh my God. And then I'll tap you and you make sure you stop. Because I had fears of her choking me out because I know how, how effective the rear naked choke is, right? 
and we would practice each other. And then one day, mate, about a year later, just rarely, every few weeks we do this, about a year later, I'm in the garden, okay, at my place, and um, I can't remember what I was doing. I might be doing, like, I don't know what I was doing. Anyway, it's on all fours. She was in the garden, didn't mean like. She jumps on my back, sinks the rear naked choke, perfect, mate. But I know you're on a, you, you know you were on a bit earlier, been on your knees. That's right, I was on my knees. She jumped on my back, she sunk the rear naked choke, naked choke perfect, mate. I only just managed, as she sunk it, I only just managed to get my hand to her forearm, which is on my neck. To, and as I started tapping her, I was going. Uh, she was like 12 years old. Like, she, I could, I could at that time, I could pick her up, I could probably throw her 10 metres. And yet that small little thing, I'm 14 stone, a small little thing in a matter of seconds, not even a second, got it on, sunk a choke at me. And, and so, let's put it in context, a 12-year-old girl, I'd managed to, if I hadn't, if if I was someone who wasn't um, familiar with BJJ or known that I'd be just taught this person BJJ mm. or knew that if I tap her arm, she's going to let go. If I didn't know that, I would be out cold on the floor because as I was tapping her arm, I was nearly gone. I was I was blacking out. It's like bang, tap, I tapped her arm. And I said, right, thank you, well done. Let's not do that again. We don't <laughs> don't just pounce on me. If we're gonna do like choke back, it's, we, it needs to be arranged, kind of thing. You know, just not just randomly on daddy. But at that moment, I thought, holy shit, yeah. that is how effective this is. Yeah. You know, uh, for a small uh, t- again, a twelve year old, probably what seven stone, eight stone, yeah. no strength. She was playing football at the time. It wasn't like a gymnast or like a, in the gym or anything. You know, some crazy freak twelve year old, nearly. Would have choked out a fourteen stone full grown man who's au fait with conflict and um, and that um, uh, uh, confrontation and all that. Uh, it's an amazing art. It's amazing art, and and also no striking. Mm. So you can the reason you can go and, as you know I'm pretty diverted. The reason you can go and um, it's okay to send your kids to BJJ classes and all that from the self defence perspective is it's not like boxing. It's not like kickboxing, Muay Thai or karate or anything else, right? There's no striking, so there's like minimal like head trauma, no head trauma, there's almost zero. But in every class, they will learn to fight. And it's not just the learn to fight aspect. I really want my younger daughter to start doing something like this because she's, she's physically very capable. Um, and she does not understand the pain side of things and what she inflicts on people if she if she does it she doesn't understand it and it's one thing that grappling uh, uh, sparring does for you is you understand because you get punched in the face obviously not in jiu-jitsu or you get choked out or you get your joint manipulated well and you experience pain which means you understand when you're doing it to someone else what the impact of it is um and it makes you just a more chilled out person as well i think uh i think they should teach it in schools to be honest if they taught it in schools which i i I think they're pushing, I think the, the Gracie family are pushing that in America. Um, they've got this big anti-bullying campaign. And uh, I think if they taught it in schools, there wouldn't really be any bullying, to be honest with you. And I think they should teach it more um, in uh, in infantry training, you know, as, as, a, as a bog standard. I remember uh, when I was a crow up in Catterick, and uh, we did, I think, maybe two or three sessions, you know. <laughs> We had some PT, uh, PTI from, uh, he's one of the Scots regiments at the time, and he'd just come back from Northern Ireland and he was teaching us a few locks and stuff, and this is what you do, but it was more riot control based. And it was like. Isn't know. it interesting that the British military doesn't, as a staple diet of training, both in your basic training um, and your you know, phase two or phase three or whatever, and as a staple, well, let's leave the unit training aside, you still, isn't it interesting that we don't have hand to hand combat? or some form of martial arts, including it. The Americans do, I think. Why don't we have it? Now, on a unit level, I, can, I can't speak for all units, but most units don't have anything like that. It's mental. I think, uh, I think the Royal Marines do it in training. I mean, I've heard that they do it on bottom field. They do quite a lot of... It, 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 but it's, it's depending on the staff. So if there's a staff PTI that's got a background in it, he'll make sure that they're all rolling yeah, around and that, the ground. And that'll be and the same for all of them. When right. I was in, I did, yeah. uh, for all units, when I was in, I did, when I was in phase one, was it phase one? Nah. Uh, I mean, phase two, I can't phase it was. We did, we were doing some, it was actually choke training. Yeah, right. uh, was it choke training? 
you know, some other stuff. But then it did, but that was just like, like you said, because if we happened to have a member of staff who was just into that kind of stuff. Um, but it's not, a, again, it's not a state of diet. Well, um, I, I said hello to, I um, put myself out there and introduced myself to Lieutenant Colonel Seamus Kelly. He's the, um, he's a fusilier. And he's on the Army BJJ team. I think he oversees it, basically. And he was competing. Um, top low light, you know. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel, and he's in the... He's in the Brit- he was, he was at the... Uh, yeah, yeah. He was at the um, the British Champs. It was at the NEC a few years ago. And he was in the Brown Belt Division. I think he got silver. You know, absolute nails. <laughs> Coming from my background, <laughs> most of our officers are into beagling and flipping... <laughs> <laughs> not dig at guards officers but it is true and I met this guy and he's like you know cauliflower ears and he's like oh, oh yeah and I was like uh, what's, what's you know where's this going so to speak and he said the thing is he, he wants to push it big time he said I'll, I've you know I'm trying to advocate this in training he said but the pushback is well you know if it has to come to fighting or hand to hand fighting we've lost the battle as an infantry yeah, it's his fucking cop out but but that's a fucking. That, that's not his opinion. And, that's no, what get, that's, 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 that's what gets fed. And back the thing to is me. with this is, it will never be a mate like. It will never be, especially in the UK, a a a, a staple of you of of the curriculum. It won't be because the stigma attached to combat arts. But what that does is it ignores. We were talking about. Let's ignore. Let's ignore that it's a it's seen as a combat art, a combat martial art, or a martial art. Right, ignore that. Okay, this is a form of exercise. Mm. Okay, which I think we're talking about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It is a form of exercise. My God, and it is Jesus Christ, it's hard. I remember coming back from, from Iraq when I'd been doing a load of stuff up there. That first time I started doing it in Iraq with those guys, because it was, wasn't just a blue belt, so a bunch of other guys did it. We were from other different background boxers, like I said, Muay Thai. We all started, oh, we'll just do, we got a blue belt here, so let's do, do some fucking Jiu Jitsu. We all bought geese and rocked up. It's like the prison fucking gym out there. And, um, I came back and thought, oh, I'll go to a class. Mate, I went to that class, right? I came out and well, I made the mistake of having a spaghetti, spaghetti bolognese now before. Right? <laughs> I finished that class, I came out, and that entire spag ball came out in the car park, right? And it was the hardest physical activity I had done in God knows how long. I was in tatters, right? So one, in terms of positives, you got that physical activity. Jesus, it's hard, okay? And if you ignore the... The, the 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 injury potential if you get an inexperienced person putting on a lock a bit aggressively or you know that kind of joint manipulation you know raking the knee and as you said earlier rear naked or get control of the back and pulling something just that kind of stuff if you ignore the, the sort of that risk which you get in any sport aside from that the the chances of long term injury are pretty small. Okay, and then you tie into that is that in every class of any well every class I've ever been to of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there is a a a point in that class. It's usually at the end for the ones I've been to, and it is you. It's sparring. You are fighting, and it's not like boxing sparring in a gym where you sort of take it like no 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 you well you take it the element of lightness to it, but you you are sparring. It's real time, so. That person is trying to choke you out. I kill you because that's what they're trying to strangle you, right? Kill you or break your joint, which is the lock. Yeah, and you do that every time. And you don't. I mean, Joe Rogan fucking goes on this all the time, and I'm absolutely inclined to agree. It's brilliant for people with egos because your ego gets fucking busted. It's brilliant to level the playing field. It's brilliant to understand your strengths and weaknesses. It's brilliant to understand, you know, get, getting beaten regularly. It's especially on your on your tr- journey up the belts, or even just towards blue belt. I'm fucking white belt. Even just towards blue belt, you get constantly beaten down. You get used to thinking, "Oh, I'm not the best thing since sliced bread." There are other people that are better than me, but also you get used to understanding where your weaknesses are and understanding how to grow. What do I need to do to succeed? And that mindset carries itself over into other aspects of your life. Okay. I thought I was brilliant at that, but I just got choked out by a 12-year-old in my garden. So I'm not that... <laughs> I'm not great at that. But you see, my, you see my point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's truth, isn't it? I think that's why it's done so well in comparison to the martial arts is because it's true. There's no 
there's there's no BS about it. And again, going back to anyone listening to this, who's like, fucking hell. It, it, there is the there is an aversion to all of the, to martial arts because of the long term injury or illness impact, and that is absolutely well founded when we're talking about head trauma, boxing, Muay Thai, karate. Well, fucking karate is bollocks. Karate is good, but it's bollocks. You don't do sparring, right? So, well, well, hang on. When I say bollocks, I mean it's it's uh, it's not bollocks. I mean in <laughs> terms of it takes it takes a lot longer to get that mental experience of consistently fighting people, fighting for your life, and understanding uh, and learning and growing from that experience, right? Um, but with BJJ. You don't get head trauma. You're not getting punched in the head. You're not getting kicked in the head. Oh, hang on. H- hang on. Oh, are you going to go on the choking? No, hang go on. on. D- you do. There are people out there that get concussed. I've been need... Accidental, though. Yeah, well, yeah, but accidental or intentional. It still happens. That's still trauma. I've come away from their bloody nose, cut it. I've never... I've never in boxing had my ear bleed from the inside, and I have in BJJ where somebody's bashed me with the knee whilst they're going from side control to a north south position or something. And yeah. you can get, don't forget, if you're doing your takedown from the beginning, if somebody does a good, like, you know, a judo throw or whatever, you can land on your head if no, you but don't. Relatively do speaking, it's yeah, just okay. head trauma. You know, it, it, you'll, get more, you'll get more trauma in a rugby match, yeah. head trauma in a rugby match, an hour rugby match or an 80 minute rugby match than you will in 80 minutes of BJJ. Yeah, right? gra- like, yeah granted. Uh, relatively granted, speaking, yeah. relatively yeah. speaking. Yeah. And so I'd love my kids. Yeah. I, I really, yeah. it won't happen. I'm like, I'm divorced, yeah. separated. Me, my ex wife, uh, my kid's mother, she has a different view on it than I do, and I would never try and change her mind because it would never happen. Right? But I would love to get, if I was going to get my kids into anything, I want. Them to experience, I want them to be able to handle themselves because there are wankers out there who are bigger and more capable than my, my daughters, and I want them to be able to handle themselves, which is why I started teaching them stuff. If I was going to put into anything, it would be BJJ because mm. I want them to be able to handle themselves. I want them to experience conflict, physical mm. conflict, but I mm. don't want them in the practice and the training of to be at risk of. Uh, mental or physical health because of it yeah which and i think yeah. the best option for that is bj yeah yeah well i mean i teach it to my oh, well i've got three kids and i teach it to my eldest daughter who's uh special needs she's got down syndrome and i teach it oh, to i didn't realize she was your eldest yeah 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 she's the eldest yeah yeah well she's my she's my stepdaughter but you know it doesn't matter um and i teach it to her and she does taekwondo because at some particular point she's going to come across some prick who will take the piss or you know try and take advantage and she, she can, she'll probably stick an arm, she'll probably take him down, stick an arm bar on him because she can, she can look after herself. So, and both my boys will learn it as well. Um, but no, it's been, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a life changing thing. And, I, I, you know, people, people throw that out quite, you know, too easy. Ah, oh, it changed my life. It really did. For me, it did. I went through, um, I went through a bad patch where I was trying to, I was chasing, um, not, not a dream, I was chasing money, basically, where I was working full-time, at a full-time job, and I was trying to build a practice, and I was, you know, and I was doing long days, and it made me sick, it made me really ill. In what way? What do you mean? Uh, stress, anxiety, IBS, I developed IBS, so I was working a full-time job, for 37 hours running a, a clinic, again, I was on site, at various contracts, and then I had my own practice in Coventry. So I'd finish work, you know, I'd start at seven in the morning, and then I'd finish work, go to the clinic, and then two, start off with two, then three nights a week, I'd work from seven in the morning till 10 at night, just seeing patients back to back, you know, and then I'd work Saturdays as well. And I kept that up for about two years, and uh, and I was trying to, you know, open practices and, I was really trying to build this thing where, you know, I could like sit back and have other people come in and work for me as well. And it just I stretched myself too thin and I got ill, put on loads of weight, developed bad eating habits because you're not training. And then oh, I drink so much coffee, you know, throughout the day. So sharp, you know, with all my patients. And you've got to be as well, write the notes, everything's got to be boom in order. And uh, I'd come back in and I'd get home about half ten, you know, miss the fact that the kids have been put to bed. But you're constantly, right, I'm working towards something here. I'm working towards something here. And because I drank so much coffee throughout the day, not like instant coffee. I mean, I I would hammer the good stuff, proper coffee. 
and I'd be like, you know, I'd have the jitters. So then I'd calm down, I'd have a big whiskey, you know, to just, or a big a half a bottle of red wine. And that went on for about two years. And then oh, I piled on loads of weight. I was in really bad fitness state. And uh, yeah, and then and, and, and I just started having dizzy spells, went to the doctor. He was like, it's stress. And I was like, oh, you know, I gave that lip service. I was like, are you sure? And he went, yeah, no, it's definitely stress. And I was like, no, look, I, I keep getting these symptoms. So I started reeling off red flags. So I was kind of forcing, because, you know, when, that's the thing. If you've got a bit of clinical knowledge, I was forcing him to tick the boxes to send me for an MRI. And he said, yeah, well, I've done a cranial exam and you're fine. And I was like, look, I've got this, this and this. And he says, OK, I'll send you for an MRI. Sent me for an MRI. It came back and he sat down. He says, yeah, it's all clear. And I was just like, oh, now that worked really well in diagnostic terms because one, it gave me affirmation that what he said initially was correct. So yes, it was stress. And, and then he says, look, and this is the pro I think this is the problem where the, the service is breaking down in regards to GPs. He says, look, I've got a cancellation. I've got 20 minutes. So we sat down. He's a few years older than me as well. So, you know, it was quite a uh, really good rapport. He's a good doctor. He ha I have actually got a good relationship with my GP. And he says, right, what are you doing? And I told him, he went, this burning the candle at both ends, ticket time bomb. This is how it is. So I waited to finish the uh, the end of the financial year, and the accountant came back. And so I'd had this from the GP that said it's stress. All right. The accountant came back and he went, "This this is how much you've made." And I was like, "Is that it? You are joking. Is that it?" And I worked so hard to get to this point, and had nothing nothing really substantive to show for it. And I put all those hours in. I'd missed all that time, you know, that I could could have been spent with my wife or the kids, just chasing this thing that essentially wasn't going anywhere. And uh, yeah, so you know, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a failure. But you know, so what, man? It's good to fail sometimes. Hundred percent. Oh, so 100%. I've just, just closed that off. Right. Uh, now I don't work weekends. I don't work nights. I turn work away. I, I, I tr you know, and I put more into myself. And then, and then this, all these events happened. Like you know, this guy, this Mark Smith coming in and introducing me to BJJ and the doctor saying, "Look, this is definitely it. It is stress. You know, you need to be careful." And then, uh, you know, and then the accountant I say it comes in threes. Well, it came in threes, all right. And it was like all of these things were basically for me. Right, I don't need this anymore, and it it works out well. So there's like a lot of practitioners out there. They want their own. They want to own their own business, and they they want to say, right, this is mine. I've built this. This is my practice. This is my name, and I wanted that, but I wanted it at the same time as working a job because I didn't go all into it. You see, I didn't like put 100 percent effort in, and because I didn't put 100 percent effort in, it it failed. But if I'm ever in that situation again, I know we, I, I learned so much from it. You know, you, you've got to learn from your failures. And I think this is, uh, you know, that, that, well, that's why I took a full-time job because it gave me the freedom to be able to, you know, good, secure wage, protected time, paid time, manual leave, and it works. Well. And, I, and, and you see so much of this bullshit on Instagram and it's like live this four-hour working day or the four-day working week, four hours, and, you know, and you can buy into that and chase it. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a decent job and, having the weekends off and, you know, doing a bit, you know, it does, what's wrong with that? Like, you know, I don't know. But I, I think, sorry, I'm going to, no, while I'm on a roll, I think that comes, you know, from the military. I, I think that's something that, I mean, you know, I left in 2002, but it, it's hard to shake, you know, because... What's hard to shake? Failure. Like, uh, you know, failing stuff. I, how I got into physio was because I failed. I failed on... Physically, or, well, physically, I suppose I did. I was on HDPRCC, you know, down in Purbright, and I picked up a knee injury, you know, and I had a really bad meniscal tear, but I recovered from it, you know what I mean? And I, I got past that, but that was like the first bit of failure that you had to go, you know, and watching all my mates get promoted, and you're like, oh, shit, I've got to wait to heal and then get back onto the next one. But it was too late by then. I'd already been introduced to physio, mm. and that's how I got into it. You know, I sat down in front of the physio, and she just... She's pretty good looking. <laughs> Had that Florence Nightingale effect on me, but she got the knee out. She was like, right, this is the knee. And then she went through the whole anatomy of the knee. Talked for was she uh, was she touching the knee, your knee, while she was No, <laughs> no oh, I know no. what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> There's no anchoring response going in there whatsoever. No, but no. Uh, no, she was touching an, an, an anatomical model, but I was just like, what a job. So then I started to research how to become a physio. 
But I think, and that takes a long time, you know, to outdo all of that. You can't fail at anything in, you know, in the military. They're that's like, they're one don't. thing. I think that's one thing. The other thing I, I retrospectively really struggle with, and I think a lot of people struggle with, whether they realise it or not, is not knowing where you're going. So when you're serving, and I think this is also true for people who are have been in the, like life, uh, have been in one job or one industry for their entire career, and then it changes. It's not knowing where you're going. So, excuse me. When we're serving, uh, you're always working, even when you're in the UK, there's always an objective or an aim. And that might be, you know, even in the time, it might be... Uh, I don't know, get to do X, Y, or Z to achieve this mark or this test or your mat, mat tests or uh, if you're on operations, it's missions and objectives and or it's rank and, you know, they're, 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 you are told what the objective is. So the, the CEO will stand up and give a battalion brief and or a unit brief, whatever you're part of, a squadron brief and it'll be okay right we've got we're doing this for the next six months because we need to we need to pass the airborne uh, airborne task force uh, criteria ready for us to take over the airborne task force and fucking such and such day. okay so now you're going then you leave right then you're not given your objectives your, or your tasks or your mission anymore and it's for you to define right and what especially in my case and it sounds like in your case is that you you end up working towards an unknown objective uh or you end up working uh towards a set when i say working i mean personal and professional life you end up moving towards a set uh you end up moving towards an unknown objective in a, in a, in uh, abiding by a set of criteria is by just because other people do it like you're saying oh i'm gonna have my own physio practice oh i'm gonna have a podcast i'm gonna set my own company or or I'm going to try and get, I'm going to try and get enough money in the bank so I'm comfortable. And they're that broad, right? One of the things I'm, you know, I'm learning as we go on, and also very, very, uh, very much attributed to my work with Imarsat as a project delivery manager. I'm, I'm, you know, I do courses with them, and I learn a project, you know, that project management side, program management side, portfolio management side. Is that it is super important? You have to know where you're going. You have to know your objectives, and I am to, and I am directly relating like project management stuff here in the corporate world directly to life stuff. You need to know where you're going, okay? Because it, no, let's rephrase that. You need to know what you want, okay? What do you want? What do you want in the short term? What do you want in the mid term? What do you want in the long term? You can split it down three ways if you want. Long term. So, for example, my long term goal is I want to get to, and I'm I, again, I'm only just giving this thought recently. Because I, because I haven't previously. My long term goal is, when I retire, I don't want to have to be relying on other income. I I want to be retiring. I want to retire and have an income that supports my, a, a decent lifestyle. I want to be able to travel. I don't want to be sitting in a house and and not be able to pay for it. I want to be able to have some some form of travel. I want a comfortable retirement. And we all want that, right? And everyone's thinking, oh yeah, well that's fucking obvious. Okay, but let's work out. But then the next stage is, okay, what does that mean? What does that comfortable retirement mean? Well, for me, again, it means I want to be active. I want to be able to have a gym membership, for example. I want to be able to travel a few hundred miles a, a month, whatever. you know. And then it comes down to, you boil it back, you can look at it and go, this is what I think I want when I'm there. And it might change, but that means about I'll need about this much money to have that. Okay, and in the midterm, what do you want? I want to be able to buy a house. All right. So it's all you know, a lot of it's money related, but also the the, the money aspect drives their emotional aspect because the the cost is driven by the emotional wants, holidays, gym, travel, couple of pints, you know, all that kind of stuff. My point is, we don't go into that level of uh, of thought, that depth of thought, in terms of what we actually want. Which means, if you don't define where you want to go and what your objectives are in one year's time, buy a new motorbike. In five years' time, buy a new house, buy a new flat, buy my own property. Or in 20, 30, 40, 50 years' time, 
be comfortable and not have to rely on the fucking government. I'll be earning a pittance when I'm in retirement, right? If you don't define those things, which can change over time, you can change the definition, then you don't know what your parameters are now, how you need to live now, how you need to conduct yourself now, whether starting up a company, your own company, or your own physio practice, or your own podcast, or uh, investing in someone else's business is going to benefit you or not. Because you haven't defined where you want to be. You don't know. You just broadly think, oh, I have loads of money. I don't have to worry about it. Oh, I want to be comfortable. With it. Even, even that, but you know what I mean, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Most people don't do that. And one mm. of the things I'm, I'm forcing myself to do now through the sort of project management experience is thinking mm. and, and experiencing that is one of the things in the corporate world, the worst thing in the world, the, the, a project that is always doomed to fail okay, is one where the end state, the objective, is ambiguous, okay, you, it's not well defined, it, or it's completely, it, it's not defined at all, or it's impossible, yeah, so, uh, I, I want to give an example, it would be stupid, it wouldn't be stupid, but it would just be boring, but you, you, you need to know where you're going, mm. unless you know where you're going or what you want, and that's it, and it can be monetary based things, it can be, um, uh, material based things mm. like I said I you know I want to buy a motorbike next year I want to buy it outright I don't want to be fucking I don't want to be um, reliant on a PCP contract or like that okay that's what I want right now that's unachievable how do I get there so how can I do that and what that means to me is all right it means it says there's financial aspects there's lifestyle aspects there's all sorts of stuff but it I know where I'm going. I know I need to achieve that. And in the t five, 10 years time, 15, 20 years time, it, what it means is I am much more aware of what is relevant and what is not in my life. So again, coming from the military, we get out, it, everything's, it, it's hard to work out where to focus your efforts. And you end up trying to do everything all of the time, everything all of the time, because you don't know what success looks like. Yeah, to you, you don't know what things are relevant to you, you, to you emotionally. Um, so we, you need to look at things and, and understand where you go with it. Otherwise, you're just fucked. And 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 that because I didn't look at because I wasn't aware of that when I left. I just okay, mission objective gone. My direction in life is gone. Like I said, I'm just trying to do everything. I'm trying to do all of the physical fitness. I'm trying to be all of the fucking alley on the piss bloke. I'm trying to be all of the great fucking awesome bloke at work. But no idea where I'm going. Burning the candle at both ends fucking rapidly. Yeah, it's easily done. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think you can, you can definitely slip into that. Especially the, I think the X Forces community can. Um, it's just something you need to be uh, particularly aware of. But what you were saying, there's so many parallels there with that and recovery and rehabilitation hang on what time what's your time is r4 yeah you need to leave at r4 uh about quarter to five what time is it now? Right, give it another, we've got about another 10 minutes okay cool so yeah so there are so many parallels to you know it, it'll be it'll be 20 past in 10 minutes so we're yeah, not yeah. gonna hear 20 past 20 past four yeah 10 yeah. minutes 10 yeah. minutes to go yeah no worries yeah cool. yeah um yeah, so there's so many parallels to recovery and rehabilitation, like what you said. It's like goals, you know, getting your goals specific, specific what do I want to achieve? Um, and I, I think that's where it was quite a funny thing, actually. Um, and, and this is why it was great to have uh, Mark Ormrod on the podcast, because... Um, you have Mark on? Yeah. No way. Yeah. yeah Shout yeah. to Mark Ormrod, MBE as of today. Oh, really? Yes, mate, oh, got MBE nice. today. Mark oh, Ormrod. <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah. Gonna, gonna, mega. I didn't oh, realise. Nice yeah, Mate, yeah, yeah. He, I've been trying to get him on here, but he lives in the fucking back of beyond in Plymouth. Yeah, yeah. It'd mega. have to be. MB. Well, I had to do online. Yeah, oh, MB, fair play yeah. to him. I'll message him later. Congratulate. There was something else I saw yesterday. You know, Jack. Um, what's his name? The chef. Uh, he's always swearing. Uh, 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 his son. His the son F word. Just, his son has just joined. Ramsey. The, Jack Ramsey. Ramsey. Gordon, Gordon Ramsey. Yeah, go, yeah. Well, Jack Ramsey, his son. Passed out yesterday, yeah. Royal Marines. Uh, yeah, pa yeah, passed out for civvies listening. Uh, Menzi got into the Royal Marines. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he didn't faint or anything. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, fair play to him. Like, you know, it's really good, that is. Most of those kids, you know, just go off and become absolute asbos, yeah, don't uh, they? Mark Olmrod's on the verge of his blue belt, is he not? Or 
No, he got a blue. He's been a blue belt for a while. Yeah, purple belt then. I don't know. No, 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 no. Oh no, he no, got no, another, no, no. No, he got another stripe on his blue belt. I saw it the other day. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so it, it so was things a... that happened for Mark Ormrod. He got a stripe on his blue belt this week. Oh, and he got an MBE as well. <laughs> the stripes more <laughs> important. <laughs> <laughs> the MBB, the MBE's gone. He's got his belt like that. Yes, um, yeah, definitely. Big up the stripes. Um, no, it, it was a good poignant moment to have him on because when I was a student, um, when I was at university, that BBC program came out, and it followed two. What program? Oh, I've forgotten the name of it now. Um, typical, you know, because of... what with Mark in it. Well, he was in it, but he wasn't the main. It was, a, it was a guy called Tom, who was an ex-para, and a lad called Andy, who was... Um, Tom was a sniper. Um, he was the first triple amputee. Um, Tom, is it Healy? Um, oh, I can't remember. I'll show you him on Instagram in a bit. But he was, the, he was a sniper, and he was the first triple amputee. And then there was a lad called Andy. He was from the Royal Irish Rangers, and... Uh, he'd lost... I think he'd lost most of his sight as well as his, his legs, and it followed them. Oh, Tom Neathway. Neathway, Neathway, yeah, that's it, yeah. And uh, and I was watching that, and they were in Headley Court, but at the same time, Mark's on there in, in the parallel bars, which are like these balancing bars on his uh, prosthetic limbs. You know, he's, he's way advanced in his rehab because it happened like, a lot of the time before him. And uh, I just remember watching it thinking, God, you know, what a, what a mega bloke. I can't wait, you know, at some point to meet him just to say, you know, because I was a physio student at the time. And then, uh, you know, it just worked out well with the jits. And he's a busy guy. I know he's busy. Who, Armrod? Yeah. But it, was, it worked out well with the jits, with the, you know, the, the fact that he's, he was the first triple amputee. Yeah, I had him on the podcast. And I literally scratched the surface with the stuff that I wanted. It's typical, you know. Like I got him on there. And sometimes, well, if you've got to, you know, naturally, if it's unscripted, you've got to let it flow. But we literally scratched the surface. And I, I was like, look, again, we've got to do it again. We just haven't got round to it. And at some particular point, I think I, w- I want to go down there. I'll have a get a roll, <laughs> you know, and then just get the camera and the mic set up. Um, you know, I don't know. How did we get onto this? Yeah, I've said the same yeah. thing. Is that because, uh, uh, man, uh, he's getting down there because he's, he, he's a busy man, obviously a nightmare. Not, like, not a nightmare traveling for him. He's a busy man and it is a bit of a pain for him traveling. Um, I'm like going down there and having a roll. He'd, he'd tie me in fucking knots. And I've got two more limbs in him. He would tie three. me in fucking knots. You've got three, three more. I've got yeah, three yeah. more limbs in him. Yeah, good point. Yeah. And he would tie me in fucking knots. <laughs> but um, yeah, what a mega dude. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. but a good, huge congratulations to him, actually. Huge congratulations to him. MB, well deserved. He's yeah. a fucking grafter. Yeah, yeah. Grafter. But, uh, but there are so many of them out there, you know, that are, you know, doing inspiring stuff. And. Um, that needs, I think, you know, that needs to be publicised, and it needs to be out there so people can see it. You know, even the general public. We, I think, you know, the the issue is the NHS was overloaded after, like, after Iraq and Afghan started to, you know, the, those tours started to go. We started to see a massive increase in amputees. Yeah, those guys were getting discharged out of the army. They were discharge out the army and it was like right well you know there's not really much we can do so we're going to medically med board med board you out then they're left without any kind of specific role you know loss of identity loss being ostracized out the unit and it's kind of like it's, it's difficult then all their care is then looked after by their gp so gp looks after you know a certain demographic of which he might have 5% of his budget attributed to diabetics who essentially, you know, further, land, further along down the line can potentially end up as uh, amputees. And he's got a certain budget he can attribute to their prosthetics. And then, so the army threw all these, the money, at, uh, well, the forces threw all the money at these guys, said, right, you can have all the top prosthetics, we'll buy them for you. But it's the maintenance, you know, so when they were going back to the GPs, the GPs budget was running out straight away. Because the GPs budget wouldn't cover you know, like Osso is like one of the top companies. It wouldn't cover the maintenance on these prosthetics. So then there was like a, for, for a while, there was this massive gap. I oh, didn't know this. Yeah, yeah. There's a massive gap where guys were like, well, I've got these prosthetic limbs, but they're over there and I, I, they need to be, they need, a, you know, a maintenance on them and they need new pistons and new screws. You know, I've worn them out and I need this replacing. And that's where the military had to step back in. And that's where charities come along. There's a big gap. And the charities kind of filled that as well, so yeah, it's interesting right. stuff, isn't it? Need to, uh, yeah, well, need we're wrapping to, it up. Uh, yeah, interestingly, I've got a I've got a mate who um, completely off topic. I not off topic. 
Um, I got a mate who was at school and college with him, and he's a mate got a brain inside of a planet. His name's um, Sean Thomas, aka Ogmo, and he's a uh, uh, which uni he's in? He's a lecturer, but he's a lecturer on law. It's crazy kind of law. Um, but uh, I, I've invited him on. Just, I think oh, I had a couple of bottles of wine one night. I invited him on to get on. He's a character. He's also switched on. He said, oh, great. We can talk about the legality and uh, who actually owns the prosthetics that uh, ex-military personnel have on their legs because it ain't them. It's like, what? <laughs> TBC. <laughs> TBC. It's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Mate, yeah. He also does freeganism. He also looks at freeganism. So uh, freeganism is... Uh, it, it, freeganism is... Uh, I'm going to butcher this, but it's it, it's the study or the understanding of. So when you chuck some, in, so when a, a business chucks them into their bin, there's a whole there's like a whole business around people who go into the bins, the refuse, and take stuff out. You know, these are old, old full meals and whole packs of steaks and stuff getting chucked out at the back of Aldi or Tesco's or whatever. It's all about, is that legal to go and take that? And then, is it, is it free or not? It's called freeganism, and he is an expert in it. <laughs> He's one of these people, mate. Anyway, I did digress. Right, uh, what have we not covered? So, uh, you need to give the links to you, your business, your podcast. Go. Uh, yeah, well, I'm in the clinic. Like I said, I'm not really taking any private. I'm, I, I work with f fighters and stuff on on the kind of um, on the side when it's needed. But realistically, uh, I'm having a break from all the kind of private practice, to be honest. But the podcast um, is the Primary Physio podcast on YouTube. It's on iTunes and all the all the rest of the outlets, Spotify, all the rest. Primary of them. Physio. Primary Physio podcast. But like I said, I'm going to be changing the name. It's going to be uh, Grappling with Physio. So I'm on Instagram. Um, I have got a Twitter account, but I don't even look at it or use it, to be honest with you. Should do. Are you aware of the Granite Zero podcast? Yes. Yeah, I really like his stuff. Yeah, yeah. Have yeah. you been in, Have you been yeah. in contact with him? Uh, I messaged him the other day, actually, about something. Uh, I'll you, tell you, you what. You should do. Yeah, you should yeah. Do. no, he's good. Like, he's uh, uh, Raffredge. Is I, I mean, yeah, Raffredge. Yeah, Raffredge. I'm talking about business. Yeah. Because yeah. he's a mate. Talk to him. Yeah, get, yeah, get in yeah. touch with him. Yeah. He's interviewing some cool guys uh, wow. and girls. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also, I will put you in touch with business wise. Mm -hmm. I'll put you in touch with a guy called Sean McAuliffe, who's ex Royal Welsh. He's uh, he is the logistics manager at Ospreys Rugby. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll tell you off air. But he trains with with a pretty significant ex boxer good to connect with 100 percent. okay mate been a pleasure yeah. to talk to you primary yeah, physio, and you. primary physio podcast unexpected well done for putting up with me when i'm on a jug of thatchers and you're <laughs> on a empty cup of coffee maybe we should do it again yeah well there's loads more to cover so uh yeah <laughs> Should we just meet for a coffee next time like yeah, we were supposed no, to today? That's it now. Whenever you come here, have a meet for coffee. No, fucking podcast. Mate, be brilliant. Nice one, mate. Cheers, Cheers buddy. buddy. Nice one. Thanks.